The first scripture reading is from Isaiah 43, verses 16 through 19. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And now would you join me while we read the second scripture reading from Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. Once at a garage sale, a woman saw a very handsome antique copper kettle for sale for only $2.50. Now, it was badly tarnished, so she asked the woman in charge of the garage sale if there was, you know, if she thought that the, 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 the dirt and the grime upon it, the discoloration, if that could be taken away. So the woman in charge of the sale said, well, let me see. And she took it back inside, had it for a while, used some copper cleaner on it and brought it back out and boy, it was gleaming. And she brought it over to the buyer and she gave it to her. And there was a little sticker on it now that said, just like new, $10. <laughs> now, interesting, when the copper kettle first went on sale, the, the garage sale owner Boy, they almost gave it away, but something changed its worth. What made the kettle a little bit more valuable? Well, it was a simple cleansing. When the owner took time to take away the grime and to get rid of the smudges and the discoloration, it almost became four times its worth. Almost everything is more valuable once it is washed and cleaned up. And I think this is most certainly true also when it comes to your life and mine. Today is the baptism of our Lord Day, but I'm really not going to focus on the baptism of Jesus. I'm going to focus on our baptism. And you see, in baptism, God gives us three gifts. He, first of all, brings us into his family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. The second gift is that you and I are given the gift of his Holy Spirit. Yeah, we might feel lonely at times, but we're promised no matter what the circumstance, we are never alone. That God is there. He's with us, among us. He's there to guide us into this life, through this life, into the life to come. But the third gift is really what I want to focus on today because the third gift we receive in baptism is forgiveness. We're told we need a new beginning in life. We're born into a sinful world. We share in that sin. And we're told that, hey, we need a fresh start with God. We're given that in baptism through his living presence and by the work of the cross in our life. But you see, that forgiveness isn't just something that happened on that day. God's presence and forgiveness is available to us every day. Every day, you and I rise to the power of sin. And let's be honest, sometimes it's a battle. You know, it's temptation before us, and, and we strive to live lives that are faithful but we all make mistakes, we all have setbacks, we have moments of unfaithfulness. But even though we rise to that power of sin before us every day, we also rise to the power of God's presence and his Holy Spirit and, and his forgiveness, his cleansing, his washing that allows us every day to be renewed in our relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Uh, one way that I would explain it would be this. Back in 2007, I bought a Mustang. I always wanted a Mustang, and it was really an, a car that I was going to baby, uh, put a lot of additions onto it, put it, made it into a pretty good muscle car. And but got a cover for it, put it in the garage, only took it out on sunny days. We never brought it out yesterday or today with salt on the road. But even though sometimes chores are something we don't like, there was one task and one chore that I really enjoyed, and I actually really enjoyed washing the Mustang. I like to see the dust and the dirt disappear on it. I like to see it you know, shine from being freshly washed and on the, on the tires giving that wet glow that you can put on it and shining the chrome and getting all the smudges off of the windows. And when I was finished, I would step back and I would, I would just admire the finished product. But no matter much, how much I babied it, no matter how much I kept it covered in the garage, you know, it still wouldn't stay and remain fully clean. Dust would get back on it. Uh, even though riding on the road, I'd look for the dirt spots and the mud spots and try to go around them. I wouldn't miss them all. One time I remember coming up to a construction site and they were paving one side of the road and they made us go on the other side. But some of the new paving, you know, the little drops had come over and I could hear it in my tires and coming up and sticking to the car. I almost had a cardiac arrest. I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> And there were times when Caleb was in the back seat, and no matter how much I told him, don't touch the windows, his fingerprints, they would go right, right there. So there were times when the car needed a fresh wash again. And you know what? We're like that. We drive through the streets of life, and the dust of sin will settle in again. We go through the, the dirty spots of temptation. No matter how much we try to get around it, there are times when we go through temptation. And there are times when the, uh, really the tar of disobedience will stick to us and we need a fresh washing. And you see, God offers the opportunity for that type of an experience, for you and I to daily be washed, daily be cleansed, daily be renewed in our relationship with him. And it's because all of that began, you see, when God came to us in baptism. And that type of gift in baptism is made available to us Right, because of the gift that God gave us in his son, Jesus Christ, that the power of the cross and resurrection is brought to us in that moment as we begin our walk with the Lord. A way that I, I, I guess I could explain that of how God cleanses us is in Mexico, I read once that there are places where there are hot and cold springs right in the same place, right next to each other. It's pretty much a phenomenon. And what people in the villages do in those areas, they take out their, their clothes there and they, to wash them. And they put their clothes over the hot springs to, to boil them. And then they take them from the hot springs pretty much just a few steps over and then place them before the cold springs, right, to then rinse them. Well, one day, a tour guide had taken a group of tourists there and was showing them the hot and cold springs. And at that time, somebody said to the tour guide, boy, the people here must truly feel blessed by Mother Nature that she provides both the hot and the cold water right there the way she does. And the guide responded by saying, well, they're not as grateful and as thankful as you think. There's still a lot of grumbling because Mother Nature also doesn't provide the soap. But you see, there, there should be no grumbling in this church today because God has provided the soap. God has provided the cleansing, the, the washing, the renewal that all of us are in need of, and he does that through his son, Jesus Christ. And he brings the reality of that for our lives beginning and every day in your and my baptism. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is talking about that Jesus has provided for us a new way of living with God, that you and I, because of Jesus, have, a, have access to God. So after saying that, he says this. He says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith can bring us, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Last week, I said to you before you went out, do you know the date of your baptism? If not, that was your homework. Go find the date. I had somebody text me, I don't know when I was baptized, right? They were, 
And then I had somebody who came by the office this week and said that they went to their safety deposit box at the bank, got their baptismal certificate out and got the date. I had somebody last night bring a booklet, a baptismal booklet and show me and in the middle, they were baptized in 1961 and the signatures on there were W. Edward Austin and John H. S. Austin, both my granddad and my dad had baptized them. But you know what? A lot of us don't know when we were baptized. That's the day of our spiritual rebirth day. Now we know our physical birthday and if somebody would forget that, boy, we'd have our nose been out of shape a little bit, wouldn't we? I mean, gosh, I got to remember my birthday, Caleb's birthday, sometimes Micah's birthday when he's home, Jennifer's birthday. If you want want her birthday, I'll give it to you later, right? But her birthday, you know, when you go to Walgreens to get the prescriptions, and that's the harder and harder the older you get. But if I would forget their birthdays, they'd probably be a little, what, upset. And if they'd forget mine, me too. But why do we not remember our spiritual rebirth days? You see, folks, That is the most important day I believe in our lives. And one thing I wanted to point out this morning is this. Our baptism though, isn't just that day in the past, but that day really defines every day for us. And that day continues to be a day of our present and will be a day of our future. Because God just isn't a God who was there on that day. He's a God who's still with us today. He's a God who is with us. He is a God who is among us. And God wishes to renew us, to refresh us, to cleanse us so that you and I can go forward in life and so that we can be who God wants us and needs us to be in life. Last week, Ben was talking about gospel resolutions and saying how we, you know, be good for us to make resolutions of really listening closer to God and seeking Christ and praising God. And that's a real strong theme at this time of year. More people are what? Forward thinking right now instead of thinking about the past. And I really believe that that goes along well with our lesson from Isaiah, because as you see on the screen, I believe God is far more interested in our future than he is in our past. And I think Isaiah 43 illustrates that. Very difficult time in the history of Israel people. Uh, They were taken to captivity. They were ruled by another nation. And it was a time when they remembered that they no longer had the land that God had promised. They no longer had all the things that they thought God was gonna give them and things looked pretty bad. And what God comes to them and says is that, look, Forget the former things. Stop looking on those. Do not dwell on the past. What God is saying to them, adjust your focus. Quit looking behind and start looking forward. And God says, you will never be able to what? Do with your life what you need to do if you continue to be focused and burdened and giving your attention to what you've been about instead of now looking forward to what we can be together. You're gonna miss what's ahead of you if in your life you're still so focused on what's happened in your life. And Isaiah comes to the people and God says, look, the reason why you don't wanna keep looking at the former things is this. One, you can't really rest on your laurels. God tells them you cannot depend, you cannot depend upon your successes of your past to sustain you. Yeah, God led you out of Egypt. God led you into the land of Canaan. God also helped you have many great victories. God even let you survive when the nation split into two kingdoms. But now you are in captivity. What the people needed was God to do a new work, to bring a new miracle, to bring a new victory in their life. And Isaiah is telling the people also that God says, look, you can't allow your past failures to possess you. How many of us do that? We allow our past failures and shortcomings, boy, to stay with us and to drag us down and really to possess us in our lives. Yeah, the children of Israel had failed many times. They too had made mistakes. They too had setbacks. They had moments of unfaithfulness. And as many times as God had brought them blessings, so many times they didn't return it to him in kind. God had given them a temple and they still were involved in idol worship. God gave them the commandments and they still approached them as if they were just suggestions. God gave them wealth, and they still used their wealth in many ways to take advantage of the poor. The children of Israel didn't deserve God's love and grace, but he earnestly wanted to give it. He earnestly wanted to change them. 
Notice the message. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. A new thing. God was not going to condemn them for their past, but was going to give them a possibility for the future. God said, look, we can have a fresh start. And I believe that's what baptism is for us. I believe what baptism is for us each and every day, God comes to us. We don't deserve it. But God comes to us and says, today we can have a fresh start. Yes, we do rise to the power of sin every day. We do have the mistakes and the shortcomings. And so many times those things remain with us in our life. But what God says is that we don't have to remain in those things. A lot of us really haven't given some of the things of our past to God so that we can really, what, let them go. And more so, so that they can finally let go of us. There are things that we are shameful of, we are, feel guilt from, things that we are disappointed of, even depressed about. Maybe it's time if we still have that type of connection with our past is to give it to God, lay it at his feet so that we can move forward, cleansed and washed. And the things that hold us down in life sometimes aren't because of our sin and the disappointment we have from that and the pain we have from that. Sometimes the pain and the hurt in our life is because of what other people have brought to us, what other people have said, what other, other people have done. And we just can't believe they would have done that. Sometimes it has to do with families. Families can be messy, right? Maybe it's time that we even give those things to God and say, God, you know what I need in my life today? I need a fresh start. Because when God brings cleansing and renewal into our life, just like that kettle, boy, how valuable are we? Not just to God, but how valuable then we can be to the other people we share life with. So with this in mind this morning, I really think what God is saying to every one of us, and it's a great thought for a new year, Let's start today with a fresh start. And I don't know about you, but, you know, my, I would say my life is pretty good. I have moments of faithfulness. But if there is someone I could start over with today of all people, man, I'd really like to start over today with God. Really like to start over today with God. And when we approach God that way, to give him our past, our sins and our hurts, you know what that also does? It then automatically opens up that we're giving our future to him as well. And I wanna challenge you today, when you give God your future, don't give him part of it. Let, try to give him all of it. Let me use this illustration to kind of get my point. Ivan the Great was a great ruler in the 15th century in Russia. Very successful in bringing all of the, the tribes of what we now know as the Soviet Union together. He was considered a brilliant general and, and very courageous. Drove out all the enemies uh, of their nation and brought their nation together. However, while he was kind of waging all of that war, his closest advisors began to get a little worried because he had never married and there wasn't an heir to the throne. And they thought, boy, if he would die, then who would take over? And it would kind of be a bloodbath, a power struggle. So they encouraged him to find a wife. But Ivan the Great felt that he didn't have time to find a wife with all the things he was doing. So he told his closest advisors, he said, you find someone you think I should marry and I'll marry them. So they went around looking to all the other nations. They found the king of Greece had a daughter that they felt was perfect for him. She was smart. She was brilliant, charming. She was young. He had never seen her, but they said, you should marry her. He said, great. But the king of Greece said, yep, you can marry my daughter, but only under one condition that you convert to the Greek Orthodox church. Ivan the Great said, yes. So he comes to Athens and he comes to Athens with 500 of his closest personal palace guards and all 500 of them, they're so faithful to Ivan, they say, we'll convert too. So they all get a crash course, right, on the catechism. The priests teach them and they can, they're ready to convert to Christianity. And so the plan is, is they're all gonna go into the Mediterranean. Imagine this, a priest for every soldier, priest would have the black robe on, the black hat of the Greek Orthodox Church. Every soldier, their full garb and all their weapons. And they will be fully immersed in the Mediterranean. But before that happened, somebody brought up the problem 
that the church prohibited professional soldiers, right? soldiers that didn't serve in a way that they wanted peace and violence and force and bloodshed was the last resort But these were really men that were known for the fact that they had a commitment and a thirst and an aggressiveness towards bloodshed. That force was always the first resort. And so the church at that time really believed that you you couldn't have these men that were considered killers also to be church members too. So a hasty round of diplomacy occurred and the problem was solved quite simply. As the words were spoken by the priest, And as the priest began to baptize every single one of them, each soldier pulled their sword from their side. And when they were immersed into the water, everything was covered in the water except for their arm and their sword. Now, when I thought of that story, I thought to myself and I said, well, you know, that can be an accurate picture of Christianity. That can be an accurate picture, if we're not careful, of our Christianity in that we want to commit our future to God, but we still hold parts of our lives out of the water. We still hold parts of our lives out of the influence of God's presence and purpose and plan. And so I I thought to myself, how many unbaptized arms are there here in our church today? How many unbaptized hearts are here, not hearts that are are fully willing to commit themselves to God's purpose for their life? How many unbaptized wills are there? How many people are unwilling for first and foremost to take direction from God for their life? How many unbaptized talents, abilities are there? How many of us are unwilling to use the abilities we have first and foremost, not for ourselves, but for for other people and and to use our abilities, what, for the ministry of God's church? How many unbaptized finances are here? How many of us are unwilling to have appropriate graciousness in the area of giving? How many unbaptized social activities are here? unwilling to be different from others when it comes to drinking or our behavior at parties or at clubs or even at bars on the weekends? How many, how many are there in our lives? And how many of us need to have the replenishing and the refilling of God's Holy Spirit in every area, especially in the places that we have kept to be our unbaptized arms. See, baptism is to bring change. And baptism is to bring change each and every day of our life. Baptism isn't a day of the past, but is a day every day where we can be forgiven and cleansed and renewed. And so I'll close with this thought. There was a machinist who worked for the Ford Motor Company. He went to a church gathering one night and was led to come forward and gave himself to the Lord and was baptized. After he was baptized, he started feeling the Holy Spirit convicting him as he looked at his past. And he remembered really all the parts and the tools that he, you know, one by one through the years had stolen and taken home to be his own from the Ford Motor Company. And so he was led the next day to gather all the parts, gather all the tools. And he took them into work and he gave them back to his foreman explaining to the foreman all the things that he had done, how, how he had taken all these things, and he asked the foreman for his forgiveness. Well, the foreman was so taken back that he cabled Mr. Ford, the owner of the company, who was over in Europe uh, looking at a factory there. And when Mr. Ford received the cable, because the foreman was asking, you know, how should I approach this? What should I do? Mr. Ford sent back a cable to the man saying this, Dam up the Detroit River and baptize the entire city if this is what's going to occur. And you see, he's right. Baptism isn't just a date of our past. It is a a daily life that has lived with God's presence and his renewing power for our lives. 
Every single day, we have a chance to be washed and cleansed. Every single day, we have a chance for a fresh start. Every single day, we have a chance to make the needed changes in our life with God's help. How about if we make every single day today? Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for who you are for us and that you bring the benefits of your cross and resurrection to our baptism. May we again relook at the covenant that we have in baptism. May we be open to the waters overflowing in our lives every day. And as a renewed and cleansed people, may we go forth, Lord, really living out that covenant empowered and filled by your Holy Spirit. And in your name we pray, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Trinity Lutheran Church can be found at 1100 Philadelphia Road in Joppa, Maryland. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you like this video, go ahead and click the like button. That's a thumbs up button right here on the YouTube page. And you could also be a big help to us if you go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much, and God bless.